Hello, I'm the Grub Street Lodger, and the sun went down as I walked home, so this is being done in harsh lighting conditions. Ooh. Uh, I have a huge pile of things to talk about today, and I want to see if I can get on with it quickly. So, let's get cracking. The first one is by Robert Graves. They hanged my saintly Billy, which is what Billy, or William Palmer, uh, what, set, what his mum said when he was hanged as the Rougely Poisoner. They hanged my saintly Billy. Now, this is a weird book because it's um, it, it poses as like a true crime book, but it's not really a true crime book. It's, uh, it's a mixture of research and novelisation, like I, Claudius, in many ways. So it, it takes some facts and some fiction and, and paints a picture. And the picture of this is not of a, a saintly Billy, exactly, but certainly of a Billy who um, didn't do the poisoning he was uh, he was killed for. I think it does ask questions also of the real Billy's trial. Uh, because he seemed to be being tried more for his, uh, his debts and his poisoning horses than he was for poisoning a person. Uh, that said, saintly Billy? I think perhaps not. Though I, I probably don't think he poisoned his wife and his kids and his brother and all these other people he's supposed to poison either. Uh, as the book went, it was uh, it was a little dull, to be honest. It wasn't the most uh, exciting until near the end with the trial and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, a lot of it was about the, the daily um, grind of uh, a doctor who spent more time on, on the horse racing circuit. Uh, that was about it. <laughs> so, I mean, it was okay. Uh, but yeah, Robert Graves... Uh, He's quite funny. He does all sorts of odd things, you know. Non-fiction, I, Claudius, this, uh, poetry, all sorts. He's an interesting person. The next book I read was Nightmare Alley by William Lindsay Graham. I watched the Del Toro film when it came out about a year ago. I bought the book straight away because I really liked the film. Uh, but I knew I couldn't read the book straight after watching the film. I had to give it a bit of time, so I did. And now with the film mostly out of my head, I read the book again. Now, I know the twist ending, or the surprise ending, or but the fact is, the book is structured with tarot cards. It's like fate. So even if you know the ending, you're rereading the book, or, or you've seen the film, whatever, it it's like this inexorable thing. You know he's coming to that point in his life. Uh, the book broadly split into two parts. The, the carny part in the carnival, where he's Stan, and the New York part where he's the great Stanton or the Reverend Stanton and he's pulling a big con. Now there were some good bits about that pulling a big con. I used to like hustle and the con goes through all the hustle sort of stages. They find the mark, they rope the mark, they research the mark, they you know, they, they do a convincer where they lose something. You know, it was all you know, textbook stuff. But... Hmm. It's a sour beer. It's all right, okay. But the uh, the best part was the carny part because the people in the carny were more lively. There was the language was just richer. It was it, the more people. It was just more going on in the carny part, uh, and and all the strange people who live there. But yeah, it's it's a good book. It's a horrifying book, and it ratches you right up to that ending. Which if you don't know what it is, uh, well, you kind of, I saw it coming in the film certainly, but. It doesn't make it any easier. <laughs> the next thing and the best thing of the month, probably, there's a lot of this month, but probably the best thing, Shark Alley by Stephen Carver. Now, Stephen Carver is uh, an academic, and he claims he found Shark Alley. It's um, the, the, the writing of uh, one of Dickens's and, and William Harrison Ainsworth friends, and he found it um, behind a whole bunch of Daily Mails in a looter's... Not Luther, Hoarder's House. Uh, of course he didn't, but it sticks to the bit pretty well. So it's in two bits. The the, the first... Uh, well, it's... Uh, start again. Two time streams, essentially. One is him being born. His name is Jack Vincent. And his life, uh, up to the point he has to board a ship, which he boards for his job as a journalist. And the next is on the ship, uh, going into what happens <laughs> and they run parallel so um 
we learn about I at first I preferred the bits about him and his childhood because for example he's locked in uh, debtor's prison uh, he's locked in the marshal sea he knows the real Nancy and, and Bill Sykes he meets Charles Dickens as a kid but doesn't tell anyone I, I knew him when he was in debtor's prison uh, and he uh, gets out of it by writing his own sort of weird gothic tales and they're wonderful if Stephen Carver wants to write any of these I'd love them uh, there's one called uh uh, shaking the Timbers which is all about a ghost ship which has like limbs growing out of it and that takes people on time travel adventures that sounds great and there's one about a death hunter sort of like a yeah, ambulance chaser who ends up marrying a woman who, who's essentially a Sweeney Todd and yeah so there, that's his life and he does really well he's in like that, that hot set with uh, Dickens and Ainsworth Harrison Harrison Ainsworth uh, but then comes the whole sort of Newgate novel um, cry and, and moral panic. And he's the one, because of course he doesn't really exist, he's the one who gets most launched into obscurity. And so there's all the bits of his life. And then he boards this ship, the HMS Birkenhead, which is a real ship. It's where we get a thing called the Birkenhead Drill, which is women and children first, because the ship crashed in an area of the sea known as Shark Alley. And there are some wonderful shark attacks. <laughs> There's a man who looks over and he gets his head bitten off by a great white. There's people who are toyed with with the sharks. There are characters we really hate who are killed by sharks. And there are characters we really hate who are not killed by sharks. Which is even more annoying. And it's, it's a really good book. It's really well researched. But the research is not like undigested lumps. It's, it's beautiful and fluent and fluid. And it goes really well. And it's very funny and... It says here, Volume 1, I would like a Volume 2, please. Um, yeah, Shark Alley, Stephen Carver. Next is Water de la Mar, The Return. This is one of those books that I keep putting on piles to read, and then it always is sort of at the bottom when I find something else and it goes in front of it. Uh, because it's got a really great premise, and that's what keeps putting it on there. And the premise is, imagine you've gone off and you've had a sleep uh, by a, uh, a gravestone, and you've woken up and you've got someone else's face. What would happen? Uh, and I think the reason it kept being sort of put off that list or, or at the bottom and never picked was because I got the sense that this was going to be a very Victorian book. I mean, it was written in 1910, but all the characters in it grew up Victorian. And though, so their reaction to Man Has New Face is to be all screwed up and weird and Victorian about it and, 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 and try and hide it from the neighbours. But not in a fast, cool way, but in a serious, oh no, what will the neighbours say kind of way. And and none of them say what they think at any point in the book. And it's just irritating. And the sentences are hugely long. And no one does things. They all just drift in annoying Victorian ways. And in the end, uh, not great. Uh, I told you I'm trying to get through these. There's a lot of them. And I'd like it under half an hour. <laughs> under 40 minutes. <laughs> Under two years. Uh, this is Ditter's Tree. It is by Gene Hughes. You see, I didn't do like an official read children's books thing, but I just woke up on a half-term day and it was grim outside and I thought, you know what, I'm going to spend all of today reading children's books and Ditter's Tree was the first one. Uh, it, as I say, it's by Gene Hughes. Uh, I don't think she's ever been to India and there's very little Indian about this and there's a slight queasiness to that. It's a bit mm, colonial, Kipling-ish. Like Ditto is a sprite, which is not a you know, mythical creature as big in India. And his friends are gnomes. And he's a sprite and the people come and they give him food for him to look after their village. And they all have sort of quirky, capitalised names. Like there's, you know, Risha, the lo laziest man in the village and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, David, the only gay in the village, all this. Uh, and And it's... A bit kind of quirky. Uh, it starts off with uh, there's a car and they ignore Risha, uh, Ditter for a little bit and he gets upset and unleashes bees on them. But the rest of them are just chaps of him helping out little animals. And it's kind of sweet. And I don't think it is racist, but but it's definitely she's definitely wearing fake Indian garb and it's it's inauthentic. It's inauthentic colonialish stuff. That isn't intended, but it just comes part and parcel with well, the chip fact that <laughs> we had lots of colonies and, and people wanted to write stories about them. There you go. 
This is Mary Anning's Treasures. It is by Helen Bush. Bush, 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 Bush. No income tax. Uh, so it's about Mary Anning. And it's about her as a young girl. Because when she was about 12, her and her brother found a, an ichthyosaur or a plesiosaur or some kind of saw, but not a dinosaur. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's about her and her brother and her dad. And his dad's teaching them how to find curiosities. He fossils and then dad dies and she takes up the business and she finds new ways of presenting them like cutting them to show the the shapes inside and different ways of uh, polishing them and all this kind of stuff and also starts finding larger and more interesting things and talks to scientists and it's it's actually a really sweet story uh, it, it definitely brushes over the fact that mary anning didn't get the money or the fame or or the recognition she deserved for all her hard work uh, in this, it's sort of presented as, isn't that nice? The poor girl gets to talk to some scientists sometimes and they half take her seriously. And you're like, well, you know, they could do a bit more than that. But still, it's a it's a sweet story about somebody who discovers they're good at something and, and works at getting better. Uh, and, and there were, you know, fishy dinosaurs in it, so that's good. Next is Eloise in Paris by Kay Thompson and illustrated by Hilary Knight. You've got to say the illustration on these because... They're a big part of it. My personal favourite illustration is this. It's the Champs-Élysées with Eloise, the little girl, um, sort of catching rides everywhere. Uh, and so Eloise is a six-year-old girl. She's from America. She's spoiled. She only lives with a nanny. Her mum is very rich and important and jets around and sometimes sends for her to Paris, even though they didn't meet in the book. And it's all about how Eloise is in Paris. And it's all this very breathless kind of run-on sentence. Uh, with big chunks of poor French in it. Uh, I'll read a bit. I'll read a bit. Oh, shit. Sorry, that's a uh, pile of Christmas presents. I am sure they are fine. Um, oh, now, I, now I can't find any bit of all the Frenchy stuff, obviously. But yeah, there's... Uh, um, so they're going to go get a ticket uh, at, the, uh, at the gallery. And they're, they're not giving us our camera... Or weenie or skifty or a plu plui, para plui, because they said we have to have this ticket. So we said, well, nous avons perdu, which is we have lost our ticket. And they said, par, par de ticket, par de camera, par de tortue, par de chien, par de para plui. So, yeah, it's fun. It's, I like it. I'd never come across a Louise before. I liked it. Next one is Five Dolls in a House. <laughs> Not in a doll's house, just a house. By Helen Chase? Claire. Helen Claire. And it's literally about this little girl uh, who can shrink and hang out with the dolls in her doll's house. But what makes it fun is it's sort of set up like a sitcom. The dolls are these very uh, bickering uh, characters. Uh, there's a monkey who lives on the roof, like a toy monkey who drives me insane. And the thing about living in a doll's house is it's not a real functioning house. So they live in this terrible, broken-down house. And she comes and she pretends she's their landlady. And, and there's this uh, one called Jacqueline who... Is trying to be very genteel, that's her big word. And she's she's trying to hide the fact that, you know, I'm sorry, our, our electrical lights don't work and our food is made out of plastic. And, yeah, it's just like a fun little sitcom set in a doll's house. There are lots of other ones. Um, though, the ending of this one says, the, the dolls go off on a mouse-drawn carriage, and it says, and everything might be fine unless they have an accident. I'm like, oh, God, they're going to have an accident, aren't they? Next book is called The Flying Classroom by Eric Kastner. K Kastner? Is that what the little dots mean? Kastner? Uh, he wrote, well, he wrote him on The Detectives. Uh, I read here The Parent Trap, which has another title recently, and, and I went with this. And uh, the, it's not about a classroom that flies, it is a sort of school story, and the boys in that are putting on a performance of a play about a flying classroom. But they have to deal with all the usual sort of uh, boys own you know boys boarding school type stories they have to have fights with the 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 rotters who go to the public school uh, not public school but state school uh, and they you know have um, emotions and and there's a secret with one of their teachers and it's a book full of very very deep romances particularly two of their teachers have a really really sweet romance uh, a man who's known as No Smoking and a guy called Justice. He's known as Justice because he's very fair and just and honest. Um, the best thing is the tone. Uh, translated by... Uh, ba -ba, doesn't sound my front. Anthea Bell. And the tone's just 
lovely. It's really, really good. Um, it's very personable. Starts off with these two chapters where Eric Kessner is saying about, or Kessner? Is, is just saying about how he's writing the book. You know, he's writing the book for Christmas, uh, but it's not Christmas. In fact, it wasn't quite when I was reading it. And and so about him going off to the mountains and, and concentrating on this book. And then the book. And it's all very sweet and lovely. And come on, I was supposed to be quick today. So Journey to Joe Berger by Beverly Naidu. Uh, so she's a, a white South African who was kicked out of South Africa uh, for anti-apartheid um activism she came to london and she wrote a book in 1985 journey to joburg uh, about uh, two children who have to go into the the, you know, the big city into johannesburg to find their mum uh, because their little sister is sick and actually it turns out it's more that their little sister is starving <laughs> that's that's the real problem and that's not something they can deal with so well and it just shows incidences of apartheid and just how these people, you know, the, the the black people there, they just have no future. <laughs> they, they, they have to fight so hard for the smallest of things. They have to have so much courage just to do normal things, like get medical aid for a baby, you know. And then they're sneered at for it. It's a, it's, 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 it's a very slim book and not loads happens, really. They go, for, they go to the city, they come back. But it, it has a... Big old wallop in it, yeah. It's very good. Um, yeah, catch that. It'll take about half an hour to read it. So, next book, got to read one of these. It's a Naomi Mitchison. This one's called The Blood of the Martyrs. And it is about um, Christians in Rome during Nero's ro- reign. Um, so, our main guy, Beric, he is the son of Caractacus or Caradog, the, 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 the British king who was... Who was freed by claudius and and so he's grown up in this weird position where he's not a roman at all but his his uh he's been sort of not officially adopted but taken in by a roman and treated like one so he's kind of one of the masters but everyone else is a slave one of the wonderful things about this book is how there's a sort of dramatis personae personae people in the book it says and you see all of that and that's all like the the free people and the Roman citizens, and then that little chunk there is the slaves, and they're actually all the main characters because it's the Christians that become slaves, and it's a really interesting type of Christianity. In this it's a social Christianity. There's not a lot of religion in it at all. Now there are them some Jews going on, um, some Essenes who have this sort of big apocalyptic version of of the Jesus story, and 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 Paul is in prison and he's trying to encourage them to think of it as a more spiritual thing and give them some spiritual thing uh, sort of notions but they're not really taking it in for them christianity is is a social movement it's a political movement it's you know there is a, an element of of uh you know jesus being a special person and being a great example and being sent by god to show them an example but the example is of of this way of life of sharing of seeing people as brothers and sisters of of um you know standing up for yourself of forgiveness there's a load in the book about the power of forgiveness and how if you forgive someone they can't you've taken some of their power off them they're not all of their power obviously because half the characters do get eaten by wild animals in the arena um yeah and one of them gets set alive as a big candle uh yeah as i say a very um appealing version of christianity uh which not say others aren't i guess but yeah, it kind of makes you uh, sad that, you know, Christianity became the Roman Empire, really. Right, next. The Dire Days of Willow Weep Manor by uh, Shannon. Shannon? Shannon? I'm going to say Shannon. Shannon K. Garrity. Uh, and so um, the main character is called Haley. And she's very, very interested in in gothic novels, and she gets sucked into one, but it's not really. It's a it's a sort of alternative universe bubble, and uh, she's got to def- defeat the evil monk who, if he takes over this bubble, can take over her world. It is a ya yeah thing, and it is pictures. It's a graphic novel, uh, and I'm not used to either of these things, but 
I really weren't that keen on that. Uh, I found the gothic stuff very, very skin deep. Uh, and I didn't think the, this this art style really fit gothic. It It's too plasticky. And that kind of sums the whole book up for me. It's very plasticky. I wasn't a big fan. So, next book. Uh, another Naomi Mitchison. It's called Not By Bread Alone. Um, I really don't get that cover. Look at that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, it's not a biblical one, despite the title. It's about uh, the, the scientists uh, all around the world, uh, and they're getting good plant knowledge. It's just set 20 years in the future whenever you read it. Uh, in fact, if, from when it was written, <laughs> it's set about five years ago. But whenever you read it, it's set 20 years in the future. Uh, and a company called Pax, who are mostly a pretty decent company, uh, certainly for an old trot like... Uh, Old Mitchison, <laughs> she doesn't paint the company as too bad, though no, there are definite bad signs of them being company. They bring all this research together and create free food. Anyone who wants food in the world can get it for free because they make it so um, rich in vitamins and proteins and just so abundant and grow so well that they can just give it away. So they do. And they don't really use it for political power except to stop people from having wars. And it all seems quite nice. Except there's a, a sub-nation in um, Australia of indigenous people who don't want it because it, they feel it ruins their relationship with the world. And as things goes on, people people start to find that life feels a bit meaningless without you know, having to work for food. I actually don't think that would be the case. I'd love a bunch of free food. Why not? I get so fat. That's me on free food. Uh, but yeah. And then there's a bit where that they've done really well with the leaves and their stems for food, but the root vegetables are a bit dodgy, and half the Philippines dies with bad taro and breadfruit or sweet potato or something. Uh, if it was sweet potato, half of Middle England would die too. But Yeah, so it's sort of like a big tragedy that upsets it all. But it's not one of our strongest ones. It's... Uh, uh, it's very slow with it coming together, all the science and the politics, and, and like everyone in its different religions as well. And she seems to be saying something about religion, but I'm not sure what. And then, um, yeah, and then and then it goes wrong, but it doesn't go wrong in completely believable ways. I don't think. Anyway, uh, blood of the martyrs. That was great. Uh, not by bread alone. That was less good. Okay, last book. K. Thompson's Eloise. I enjoyed Eloise in Paris so much. I bought a copy of Eloise for 50p in the chat shop. Uh, and it's about a girl called Eloise who lives in a hotel with her nanny and runs around and has fun. And I don't think she is a big brat. I think she's often trying to help. But there you go. Okay. Show's time. I'm trying to keep it short. Amendments. A play on words. Uh, this feels like a long time ago now. So this was uh, two people. One was the HR officer. He was inviting in the guy uh, to talk about some, some dodgy things that had gone on. And the, the HR officer was was, uh, was was political correct gone mad. And they had a debate about uh, politically correct speech and stuff. And it wasn't really a debate because the HR guy was such a twat. <laughs> He was the most entertaining character. He had all the best lines. But he was such a duplicitous, obviously insincere person that, that you were supposed to be on the side of. Yay, free speech. Let me let me be racist and stuff. Yay. Free speech means being as unpleasant as I want to be and making other people scared to work where I am and be where I am. Yay. Yeah, it didn't quite do it for me. Uh, next was Elephant, which was one of the best things I have ever seen. This is also the script. I also read it, so it sort of counts as a book. Uh, it's written by Anushka Lucas, and she, um, it's a, it's a one-woman play. She plays the piano in it. The songs are lovely. Her voice is great. Um, and, and the central theme is of the piano. So the, the idea was it's, uh, an old ivory and, um, mahogany piano in ebony. Ebony and Ivory, you know, the old song, Come Together Harmony. No, the piano, as a physical object, has items ripped out of various countries, including, of course, out of an elephant's face, hence the term elephant, and has been 
hacked together into this this uh, European model and put in 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 parlors in all middle class houses around the country. Yeah, it could be seen as a, as a symbol of violence. Yet at the same time, you know, the notes of the piano they bring a room together. They 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 bring people together. They create beauty. So it's not wholly bad, and it's not even you know how it's made is bad, but how it's used could be anything. And there's a certain um, uh, it's not a dogmatic play. And it's a very entertaining play. She's got a novelist way of, of details. It starts off with the piano being airlifted through a, a window that's been ripped out. And just this piano coming down like this thing from heaven. It's beautiful. There's so many good little bits in it. Uh, uh, her mum is a wonderful character in it. Anyway, next play was called Guy Forks It Up. Uh, it was a uh, parody, a, a farce based on the gunpowder plot, which itself was a complete and utter farce. Just ask Mr. John Johnson uh, how well his alibi went. Or indeed the people who accidentally blew themselves up with their own gunpowder. But uh, this was made it more of a fast sort of uh, airplane, grab any joke you can. It was by some of the people who were in that, uh, in, uh, in Spective Detect, no. <laughs> Inspective Defective? Defective Inspector? Something like that. So, yeah, not a very sophisticated kind of humour really. But pretty consistent uh, and then the last thing I saw I saw yesterday it was called Monster Show and it was so so this is the 1931 James Whale Frankenstein film it's being shown in mute this is a person dressed as Frankenstein's monster recreating the entire thing uh, dialogue uh, sound cues special effects uh, score and even Foley uh, and that's what it was. And it was supposed to uh, be an uncompromising attempt to redub every moment of audio to as a transact of purging outdated narratives. It wasn't really. It was just someone doing the whole of a 90-year-old film. But as such, it was very entertaining. And that were all of the 13 books, I think, and five shows or four shows or how many shows uh, that I saw and read in this month. And okay, I didn't get it under 20 minutes, but I did get it under half an hour. Not bad. Storm coming now. Enjoy. <laughs>